years and as organisations and industry are changing. So we're really proud to be sharing today um, Jessica Hornsby, um, who is our guest speaker from um, and is an organisational psychologist with over 13 years of experience uh, spanning public and private sector and from startup and scale up right through to global matrix organisations. <laughs> And at, at, at Qualital, um, Jessica leads the pursuit to develop a different working world, one where the human experience is exceptional and where machines serve to augment and enhance the human experience and where companies help people and planet thrive. So a really wonderful mission statement there, Jessica, and it's a real honour to have you join us today in this uh, uh, webinar. Alongside Jessica today, I've also got our uh, Chief Learning Officer, Rachel Kay from Babington, who's over 25 years in the learning and development space, and she's held executive roles in Talis and Capita and worked in both public sector and private sector clients. And as Chief Learning Officer for Babington, her remit is to meet the challenges faced by industry on developing new business operating models, um, and as a result of COVID and identifying the skills and capability agendas required to support businesses grow and build the workforce of the future. So um, I'm really lucky to call uh, Rachel my boss. Um, so uh, real privilege to have you on the call today as well, Rachel. And also joining us as part of this um, webinar today is Claire Moore. Um, and Claire is our Head of Professional Services and a great colleague I work alongside here at Babington and has over 18 years of experience within the um, educational services industry. And um, again, as worked, you know, Claire leads a large organisational team um, delivering over 10 professional qualifications um, in a variety of sectors such as project management and leadership and management. And having managed teams in virtual environments for eight years, she has a thorough understanding of the real importance of psychological safety in effectively managing and caring a team in the hybrid world. So on to today's session, welcome to all our guests. I guess the, the, the key thing to just sort of jump through is what's the agenda going to look like today? So uh, a little bit like Chris Whitty, the next slide, please. Um, just to sort of give everyone a bit of an idea of what the agenda is looking like for today's session. So um, I'm going to hand over shortly to Rachel and Jessica to do a little bit more of an introduction around Babington and Equalital. Um, but then what we're going to then hand over to is Jess to really talk about what is psychological safety and. I think I've. Oh, we can hear you. Still muted. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Rachel now to talk about having Yeah, if I could, if I could just ask everybody to mute because we're getting quite a lot of background noise. So if you don't just mind putting yourselves on mute, and then it's um everybody can hear really clearly. Thank you so much. Um, right. Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon now. Sorry, we've gone into um. Yeah, as Phil very kindly did. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Phil. Rachel Kay, and I'm Chief Learning Officer. Um, the good news is I'm going to be literally speaking for two or three minutes this morning because. I'm really um, pleased with the partnership that we've created with Jess and Equital and, and Jess and I've worked together for many years actually Jess was part of the team that I worked at when I worked at Talis so um, a long relationship and the reason why we've created the partnership is because we believe that psychological safety is actually something that's really key in terms of um, you know building organizational culture if organizational culture is driving behaviors in the workforce we need to have a look at the importance of um, psychological safety and how we're all operating specifically um, post the pandemic with the new ways of working at Babington obviously you know our core business is around um, um, developing um, apprenticeship programs, looking at sort of upskilling and reskilling and, and our clients around their talent agendas. And there are three things about the relevance of psychological safety in the work that we do. And I'm just going to talk to those and then I'm going to pass over to Jess. Um, the first one is around um, it's really important that when we develop our programs that we focus on the rounded individual. So what we don't do is just focus on producing great technically competent individuals, but 
you know, people that are really able to act as business partners in their organisation and that, you know, are able to support business growth and and, and performance. Sure. Um, so the rounded individual and having psychological safety as one of those subjects has been key in our design process. The second thing that we look at is that we really focus with our learners on managing self and how you do that. And again, Jess will talk to that later on. Um, and I guess one of the key areas in psychological safety, and again, um, Jess will pick up on it in her in her notes, is that one of the areas that people need to be safe in is a safe environment to learn. Um, and we can talk about that in the sort of Q&A um, section at the end. But we're a strong believer of that, not only from, um, you know, part of our process of being an apprenticeship provider, but also, you know, we generally believe people need to be given, you know, the right environment to learn, to make mistakes, to reflect. Um, and, you know, we've built psychological safety into um, the way that we've designed our programmes. So um, without further ado, I think it's probably more important that we pass on to Jess and, and get on with the session. Um, I really hope you enjoy it. Once we've gone through Jess's content, she's going to make it as interactive as we can do on screen. And then we're going to come to the panel and it's going to be a chance for you to ask some questions you can pop them in chat um, or we can take them live um, and we've got some questions that have actually come from some clients already so we'll be able to share those with you so um jess i think it's a double act now so over to you and um uh, we'll talk to you uh, in the at the end when we um get to the round table piece thanks rachel hi everyone um phil introduced me but just to quickly say i'm uh, jess hornsby i'm a business or organisational psychologist, depending on if I'm introducing myself to a private or public sector organisation. Um, and yeah, so I'm. why am I an organisational psychologist? And for me, I'm very, very passionate about creating a working world that works for everybody, works for profits, planet, people. Um, and I do think that's possible. And I think very often leaders aren't sure how to make, pull all of, all of those levers um, for the best um, results across the patch. We spend about 90,000 hours on average of our life in work. It's quite shocking. Um, and psychological safety for me is a, a topic I'm very, very passionate about because you can imagine with spending that kind of time in work, it has a significant impact on your overall life. Um, you know, and to spend that time either feeling psychologically safe or unsafe can have a huge impact on how you feel about, about your, your life satisfaction. So I run a company called Qualital and, and essentially I help clients to achieve um, a great working world, a different working world. And we're in a really interesting time. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I don't need to remind you all. We've just come. I always say last year, but it was actually two years ago now when the pandemic struck. I can't believe how much time has gone. Um, OK. Um, so what the pandemic showed us is that organisations can pivot at speed when they need to. Um, organisations, everybody rallied around to put physical safety as a priority to so people's health. Yes, the government had to put things in place, but it just showed that the flexibility and, and I was absolutely amazed, as I'm sure you all were, in terms of the flexibility that was shown on the part of employers and employees to be able to make this work. Many organisations rose to the challenge. Many organisations are continuing to keep some of those um, learnings today. Um, but what it did do those two years ago was to really change our view of, of work. Our work-life boundaries became blurred, and for some people that was great. That worked well because they got to take the dog out in daylight hours whilst also being able to get back up to work in their lunch break and not really miss any time. For some people like me, for example, I realised how much I missed that commute home from work as a way to psychologically decompress after a really difficult day and to have a boundary between my home life and my work life. So for some people, those boundaries becoming blurred were a great thing. And for some people, it weren't, they weren't so good. But what we know is the signs of life slipping back to pre-pandemic is, is not really going to happen. There are some organisations who are trying to go back to old ways of working, nine to five, sat at a desk. There are other organisations who are really embracing how can we take the best of what happened? And how can we take the best of face-to-face -face work that we lost during that time? So it's a real opportunity to reimagine what I describe as the psychological contract. Why do people come to work? What do they want from their job? 
And I think a two year pandemic has probably accelerated the psychological contract or people's expectations of work by about a decade. You know, I think if we hadn't had the pandemic, we probably wouldn't be putting these questions in place. These things weren't psychological safety, for example, was a topic that was talked about a lot before the pandemic, but it certainly is talked about more now than ever. And I think what we'll talk about is how hybrid working has helped or hindered um, psychological safety. Next slide. What we also know is that it has triggered, the pandemic has triggered what we're calling the great resignation. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, but people, because that psycho psychological contract is being reimagined, People have put life into perspective. People have realized that life is fragile. I know a lot of people were personally affected by COVID. People have been able to see a different way of working and people are starting to vote with their feet. They're starting to leave jobs. There's now more candidates than there are jobs. So people really do have the pick of the bunch in terms of the companies they want to work for. I know that a number of clients of mine have talked about being interviewed by candidates more than ever before it's a really is a two-way process now it's not about what can you give our organization but people are asking what can your organization give to me um, and people are leaving those jobs that felt maybe toxic or psychologically unsafe and they're saying i want more i want i want i want less more or different than what was happening before we also know that there's potentially a recession coming and there's some indications of that and that'll change things all over again but for now, we know that things have changed, things are unlikely to just slip back. And for me as an organisational psychologist, I see it's a huge opportunity to reimagine what the working world can be like and for organisations to embrace psychological safety, cultures, hybrid working to be able to offer a great employee value proposition for their, for their people. Next slide. So what is psychological safety? It feels like a bit of a theoretical a bit of an academic term but essentially what it means is that I feel included safe to be myself I feel safe to learn as Rachel said so I feel safe to admit that I don't know and I feel safe to ask questions safe to contribute <clears throat> so I, I feel safe to be able to share my ideas that they'll be heard and I feel safe to challenge and I can do all of those things without a fear of being embarrassed marginalized or punished in some way so I asked you all uh, to use your reaction button. So what I'd really like you to do is thinking about your own working environment or even thinking about past working environments. How many of you feel that you've operated in a really strong psychologically safe environment? Can you give me a thumbs up? And I want to see how many we're going to we're going to get. Amazing. Oh, look at all those thumbs up. That's so good to hear. So good to see. I'm now going to ask the question, has anyone felt psychologically unsafe? Maybe not a thumb. Doesn't feel. Maybe a hand. Oh, that's a hand. Maybe a shocked face. Can you give me a shocked face if you feel that you have felt unsafe at times? So oh, still a lot, actually, still quite a lot. <clears throat> so I thought if we go on to the next slide to bring this to life rather than being a theoretical thing. Let's talk about what it feels like, and then I'm going to ask the question again. So psychological safety, it, it might feel different for different people. So I'm just going to throw some things out there. It might feel like I feel nervous all the time. I feel like I really need to over prepare for every meeting because I feel like I'm going to get caught out. It might feel like the demands on you are unrealistic, like there's chaos, like you'll never be able to achieve what you're being asked to achieve. And that you don't feel that you can be honest about that because it might reflect badly on you and your and your motivation. It might feel like you're criticised more than you're told what you do well or, or that you feel appreciated. You might feel scared that you're going to be put on the spot during meetings. You might feel like you have to work late every single day just to get on top of things and you can't admit that you're doing that because it looks like you're not keeping on top of things. It might feel like you have to sometimes hide mistakes or be a bit creative with the truth because you don't feel like you can admit that maybe something's gone wrong. So you're scrambling to, to make a story work or to make something look like it hasn't gone wrong. And also one that's really relevant 
thing. I'm a parent of young children. It might feel like you have to hide your home life, like you have to pretend you're not parenting or you, you don't have kids to deal with or you don't have parents that you need to care for. It might feel, someone said to me once that when you've got young children, you're trying to have a, a career that you have to parent like you don't work and work like you don't parent. And that feels very, very true for me. So in a psychologically unsafe environment, it might feel that you have to pretend that you don't have this life outside of work. So I'm going to ask the question again, now that we've kind of talked about the feelings, do any of you feel like maybe put, put another reaction if that's maybe changed your feelings around how psychologically safe you feel? So put a clap if you feel that maybe that's changed your perspective somewhat on what this might feel like. Because it's really important, I think, to take these academic terms and to turn them into what that feels like in the workplace. And there might be times where you feel nervous and it might be a one off. It might be because you've got a big presentation. It's just a one off and that's fine. But the things I've just described, when you know it's really psychologically unsafe in the environment you're operating in, this tends to be the norm. This tends to be how you operate most of the time and how you feel most of the time. What drives this psychological danger? What, what drives this feeling and those feelings that I've just described? What we know is that poor leaders tend to create pace and pressure and chaos um, rather than prioritising really effectively. So great leaders prioritise really well so that people have clarity, their expectations are reasonable, they know what to work on over other things. And years ago, when, when I was studying occupational psychology, we learned about what we called management science. And management science was when old, old ways of thinking was I'll time how long it takes to do a task and then I'll get everybody to do it within that time frame. So and if you don't monitor people and if you're not on top of people, they're inherently lazy and you have to be on top of people for people to perform. Very often, those psychologically unsafe environments are driven from that old world thinking that you have to be on top of people you have to be creating pace pressure chaos to be showing that you're productive to be showing that you are being um working hard and that you have to create a, an element of fear people should feel that way and we know now that we know there's so much evidence now that that isn't the case actually we know that and i'm going to show some of the stats later around the benefits of psychological safety but very often where you see some of those behaviours coming out, it's really around still being embedded in that old, old way of thinking around how you engage and how you get the best out of people. On the flip side of that, so if you go to the next slide, what can a psychologically safe environment feel like? So people cut me slack when I mess up. I, everyone messes up. I don't care who you are. Everyone makes mistakes at times. And you feel like people cut you some slack. I'm happy to be vulnerable, so I don't mind admitting that I don't know everything or that maybe I've, I've got some gaps that I need to work on. And I can ask for what I need in order to get the job done. So if I don't have everything I need, I can ask for it. And I, it feels like that's not going to be uh, me admitting that I don't know or that I'm, um, I'm not keeping on top of things. I feel like working harder. This is a really um, poignant one because actually in psychologically unsafe environments, People work very, very hard. They're more likely to be burnt out. Um, but actually, in a psychologically safe environment, people also work hard, but they work hard because they feel like they want to. They're motivated to, not because they're scared not to. It's a very, very different feeling. In a psychologically safe environment, people ask about my poorly dad or my kids, and they ask if I'm OK. So they recognise that you have a life outside of work, and that does impact the way in which you come to work and the way in which you might engage in work um, at times. I'm given time to learn and that's paid. That's not expected to be in my own time late at night. That's part of your job. Learning is embedded in how you do things. That doesn't mean that everyone is nice all the time. It doesn't mean that everyone has to agree all the time and every conversation has to be pleasant. It's quite the opposite, actually. You embrace the conflict. You feel safe in the conflict. You feel able to have those debates and you feel that people have your back, that it's that you're still supported even when you don't agree with everybody. So that's a really important distinction as well, because when I talk about this to some leaders, they're like, well, actually, you know that you can't all get on and you can't all have this nice overly collaborative environment where nobody makes decisions or, you know, so it's a real clear distinction that you can still have firm leadership 
and have a psychologically safe environment. And that's one thing, if you take anything from this, I want to be taken from it, is that psychologically safe doesn't mean unproductive, it's quite the opposite. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't push people to perform at the best of their ability. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later in terms of the hierarchy of needs. So if we go on to the next slide, and we'll talk a little bit now about what are the benefits. These seem really obvious, and I'm sure most of you on the call, you've dialed into this because you care about this topic. It's quite amazing to me, actually, that these benefits aren't always obvious to people. Um, burnout, for example, engagement and well-being. Well-being is a topic that you'll see in the, if you're close to the literature, if you're close to kind of thought leadership on ways of working. Well-being is picking up in pace as well as psychological safety. The two are very much linked. Um, but what we know is that burnout costs organisations about 156 billion annually across the globe, across all organisations. That's a huge amount of lost earnings for organisations who are driving a culture of burnout, of fear, of psychological unsafety. Um, innovation, this is something I, I'm very passionate about innovation. Innovation is in almost all organisational strategies, if they're thinking about how do we adapt, how do we plan and evolve as an organisation, how do we evolve our products, how do we keep in on top of what customers want and evolve our products accordingly. If you have that in your organisational strategy and you don't operate a psychologically safe workplace, then you will be missing huge opportunities. Organisations that have psychologically safe environments tend to have 19% higher revenues through innovation, so we know that it matters. We know that those positive cultures really do make a difference. Attraction, so as I said earlier, the great resignation, people are rejecting organisations based on their culture, overpay, over salary. We know this, pay isn't enough anymore to keep people. Security isn't enough to keep people in jobs anymore. People don't crave secure lifelong jobs in the way that they did. So organisations now have to attract talent and they have to attract it in a way that makes them draws talent to them and one of those key differentiators is the culture and psychological psychological safety is key to positive working cultures and problem solving so we know that 85 uh, teams that are inclusive diverse psychologically safe tend to make better decisions 85 percent of the time that's a huge statistic when you think about decision making if you if you imagine that psychologically unsafe environment i described where you don't feel like you can admit mistakes you don't really feel like you can put your ideas forward when you're in those environments and decisions are being made i imagine decisions aren't being made at the most efficient or effective in the most efficient or effective way and that's very much linked to the benefits of psychological safety next slide so this is a bit of a tentative link, but when I was studying to be um, a psychologist, before I did organisational psychology, I did uh, counselling psychology. And I was introduced to Maslow's hierarchy of needs there. It's a bit of an old model. It's It's been um, debated many times in the literature, but I really like it as a way to describe the human condition, what we all want as human beings. And self-actualisation, for those of you that aren't familiar, is it's kind of a point in people's lives where they feel completely fulfilled, like they've fulfilled their potential, they are firing on all cylinders, that they have really reached that peak part of their life where they feel at peace, they don't feel that they need to compare themselves to others in a negative way, and they feel content. I remember when it was described to me, and I was like, I want that. I want to be at that place where I'm self-actualized, that I can be the most that I can be and that you continue to develop and you continue to grow, but actually you feel really at peace with yourself. And what we know and what Maslow described is that for anybody to reach that uh, state, there are a number of things that have to be in place before that. And I always link this to the workplace, but at the bottom of that hierarchy is physiological needs, air, water, food, shelter, clothing, the things that we know that it's really hard to feel anything at the other levels if you don't have those basic needs met. Next up is safety needs. So we need to know, if I compare this to the workplace, we need to know that if we're not gonna fall off our chair and, and break our backs, if we're working on building sites, we need to know that we're not going to risk our lives every single day in what we do and that the good care and attention has been given to that. If I compare it to personal lives, you know, we need to know that we are employed and we've got resources, we've got the, the health support that we need. 
organizations tend to be really good at uh, helping people meet those safety and physiological needs, partly because they're in, written in law, you know, th there's laws that govern this and organizations can't not do these things legally and, and be uh, legally, uh, what's the word, you know, above board. It's one of those things that when you legalize it, of course it gets done, but if organizations stop there, what is the missed opportunity? So you imagine an organization full of people that are self-actualized, that they're at their peak of their potential. They feel um, that they're not fighting for survival. They feel really content and, and at peace, but they're still growing as individuals. And to get there, we know that we need love and belonging. So in a work context, Text. That means inclusion. You know, I need to feel like I'm included, that I have a place here, that I don't feel like I have to pretend to be somebody else. Esteem. So in a work context, you know, I, and psychological safety is very much linked to this. I need to feel that I, I have something to offer, that I have value and that that value is recognised and that I do know that I need to improve in areas. Yes. And I have feedback on that. And it's in a safe environment. But I also feel like I'm good enough and that I, I add value within the role that I do. And then we can have an organisation that people are heading towards that self-actualized state. It's a tentative link. I'm the one you know, linking it from what is really a life, deep psycho psychological framework around human motivation, but actually in the workplace, how can we map that to where organisations tend to stop, tend to do things less well. Um, and I feel that the green and yellow, I feel that there's a lot more work to do. And this is very much what I, work with organisations on is how to get to that next level of people feeling at their best selves. Next slide. I'm desperate to ask questions, there's probably too many people on the call to open that up. So the next question then is to imagine a world where psychological safety was taken as seriously as physical safety. Imagine where all of the things I've described were just part and parcel of a job. You didn't have to start a job one thing that organizations tend to do is paint a really positive picture of the culture when on their externally facing uh, websites or in their talent attraction but talent very quickly come in and they realize actually what you've said the culture is like i'm not living that i'm not experiencing that and um, and that is what i encourage organizations to make sure that what they're selling outside actually is being lived and breathed so on that note, what can organisations do about it? We've talked a lot about what it is, what it feels like to have psychological safety, what it feels like when it's not there. But what can we do about it if it's missing? Go on to the next slide. I'm really, really lucky that I get to work with leaders on this. I spend most of my time in the space of leadership, um, assessing leaders, coaching leaders, working with leaders on how to create better and more positive cultures. One of the things I do with leaders is to help them manage chaos, help them address it, help them anticipate better, prioritise better, help them understand that chaos doesn't equal productivity. Um, and here are a list of some other things that I work on with organisations. So creating a feedback culture. I mean, you write them down here and it sounds really easy, but it's very difficult to go from that psychologically unsafe environment to authentically having a really good, strong feedback culture. So, for example, you can't say, I've had some guidance and now I'm, I'm going to start asking you for your feedback because if people don't feel safe, they're not going to give feedback. So it's like a chicken and egg situation. You know, you've got to feel safe to give feedback. And if you've got a legacy of psychological unsafe feelings within the organisation, it's a real tough job to create that culture of feedback. But there are ways in which you can do it, taking a longer term view. If there's leaders on the call and managers on the call that really want to, um, not even just leaders and managers, actually anybody in a working environment, get to know people, get to know people on a personal level. I know in, within one of the teams I was working in, um, we all agreed during the pandemic that we would just check in with each other at the beginning of a call. It sounded like, on paper, it sounded like a really great thing to do to show that we all care. And I remember I checked in the one day and I said, you know, I've had an awful night. My son was really young, I hadn't slept. And everyone on the call went, oh, well, that sounds awful, Jess. Anyway, back on with the agenda. <laughs> so it's not just checking in with people and getting to know people, but being really authentic in that and responding. So I reflected on it afterwards and I thought, I'm not going to say that again. I'm not going to kind of put myself out there and say that I'd have, I'd have had a tough night. And I thought, what could they have done? They could have just said, Do you know what, Jess, go and get a cup of tea, take five and come back and join us when you've got some caffeine or 
anything that shows that you're actually listening to what people have said and checking in with people and responding authentically. So authenticity is really key to this. Um, provide options for contribution. So this is something I work on, particularly when working with organisations to be more inclusive. So remembering a part of psychological safety is safe to feel included and be yourself. Particularly in a hybrid world, it's really difficult for uh, when we were face to face, that kind of environment worked really well for extroverts. But if you were more introverted, some people felt really drained by those environments. So there are really real opportunities to be more inclusive in the hybrid world, but making sure that there's options for everyone to contribute. So if you're somebody who isn't confident speaking on teams, is there a way that people can use the chat? Is there a way that people can reflect and come back with thoughts afterwards? having options so that it isn't just the kind of those that are confident enough to speak on calls get heard and those that don't their thoughts don't get shared so for people on the call that are thinking about in this hybrid world particularly how can I do that is making sure that you give people lots of op options to contribute and to have their say if your leaders on the call practice vulnerability it's one of the key things it's very very hard to do if you don't work in a psychologically safe environment um, one of the things I know we talked about um, when we were running through this yesterday was actually if I'm an employee, I'm not a leader and I don't feel psychologically safe, what can I do about it? You know, what what can I do? And the, the truth is, it's very difficult if you don't feel psychologically safe and you're you're blamed and you feel that there's a culture that feels quite tough. Very difficult for you then to show vulnerability. So it really is difficult for uh, unless it's being role modelled by leaders, it is difficult, but not impossible for people to have an impact. And I'll share a little bit about that later on um, in terms of what you can do if you're on the team thinking, if you're on the call now thinking, I don't have this, but I, I'm not in a position of responsibility to change this. What can you do? For leaders and managers on the call and for colleagues alike, listen more than you speak. I mean, these are really simple things. It's, it's not saying them, saying them is simple, living them is, is more difficult. Observe and reflect, adapt, be prepared to pivot, be prepared to learn. We talked about a learning culture. Um, be prepared, prepared to change your view and you know, to think differently. And a really key one is being aware of power dynamics. So when you're a manager or a leader or a trainer in a learning environment, you naturally hold power. Whether you want to or not, you naturally hold that power. Um, and being aware of those, that power dynamic, is really powerful. So you can give that power away at times. You can bring other people in and get other people to share their thoughts and not be the one that needs to hold that position of power. But likewise, like I was saying, organisations that are psychologically safe, it doesn't mean always giving your power away as a leader. There are times where you need to make decisions and you need to use that power dynamic carefully. But being aware of it and using it in a uh, intelligent way is what we know would be really great in terms of creating that psychologically safe safe environment. I'll just come back to that point actually in terms of if you are somebody that's on the call and you're thinking I, I just don't feel psychologically safe, I don't know what I can do about it. Um, one of the things I'd suggest is thinking across those four areas of psychological safety. So being, we talked about them earlier, feeling included, safe to be included, safe to learn, safe to contribute and safe to challenge. Reflect on where you don't feel safe is it across all four of those? Is it maybe just one of them? Is it that you feel that you're not included? Is it because, you know, what, what element of safety is missing for you? So really reflect on that and start to observe that in calls in the way that you work is something I'd really advise. Something I'd also advise for people who feel that they don't have the ability to change things at a cultural or leadership level is finding somebody in the organisation who gets it, who is a safe place, somebody you can be vulnerable with. Hopefully there's at least somebody in the organisation that you can have and hopefully a relatively senior person. So it might be outside of your immediate team, um, but somebody that you can speak to and say, this is what I'm feeling. What are you thinking? Am I, you know, what do you feel this as well? And somebody that you can have a really open, honest conversation about how you're experiencing the culture. So it's just a couple of things to do, but it is very, very challenging um, at the more junior levels to change um to change this but if you can find that person of safety and if they're in a more senior position to you can you help to leverage their capacity to help you start to change things start to create that feedback culture so i'm at the end of my 
formal slides, but I am desperate to get stuck in and to hear your thoughts. So shall I hand back over to, is it Phil or Rachel in terms of the next piece? Yeah, I think it's me, Jess, to, yeah, as we go into the next part around the, um, the panel discussion and the questions that we've got. But thank you so much, Jess, for taking that through. I think that was a really fascinating and really insightful um, talk you've just taken us through. And, and there were some definite points I was making a note of there myself around what I do as a leader um, for my team, as well as how I feel as well and what I can do to create that. But uh, I think it's really powerful knowing what you can do as an individual, because I'm sure there are a lot of people on this this listening in who either know and spot individuals that might be feeling like that. So how do they do something? But yeah, absolutely uh, knowing what to do themselves. So what we're going to do now, and Corey, you've got your your hand up and um, we are going to take some questions in, in a minute. So if you've got a question, I will I will come to you in a moment. Um, Corey, if you, if you did want to ask a question or you can post it in the chat. Um, but yeah, we're going to just uh, open up. So we've got Jess, Rachel and Claire now, and we are going to uh, start off with um, a bit of a question that that we sort of, you know, we want to really sort of really explore. But Rachel, to come to you first, um, you know, I think you sort of touched on it in the early part, but listen to what Jess has said. How does how does psychological safety play out in our apprenticeships? And I'm going to pose that to both you, Rachel, from a perspective of looking at our, our, our proposition and our, our development of our programmes and, and what we offer as, as, as apprenticeships here at Babington, but also to you, Claire, from a head of delivery perspective and how that shows up from, from a delivery perspective. So over to you, Rachel, first of all, how does this play out in our apprenticeships? Mute, How very 2020. We've not done that for a very long time. Apologies for that, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you to Jess. I was just saying very insightful um, as, as normal and a great keynote. Um, yeah, just really quickly, because I'm going to pass over to Claire because I think she's got um, probably a lot more to say. But, you know, for me, it's linking back to some of the things that Jess talked about from a skills point of view. So supporting, you know, people in that learning environment to be able to build up their skill banks of asking questions to spend time thinking about how do you reflect on you as an individual and, and what does self-actualization actually look like from a motivation point of view whilst you're learning or perhaps even in you know the role that you've um, that you're currently undertaking and and how can you improve that so I think from our point of view when we're designing our product it's about the skills that you need as an individual and certainly when we're doing leadership programs it, it's supporting our leaders to be able to um, you know build those psychologically safe environments and and spend time being really authentic in their leadership which I think is what um, Jess was referring to but Claire do you want to pick up on you know some of the things that we do um, from sort of a learner point of view? Yeah absolutely so as part of our delivery our duty is to ensure that our learners not only have a safe learning environment but they're also safe at work and that's part of our safeguarding responsibilities so as part of that safeguarding responsibility, we actually have a designated team called our safe and sound team. And that team is focused on upskilling the delivery team to make sure that we have hot topics like psychological safety are at the forefront of our delivery and making sure that these are interwoven into our skills coach sessions. So it forms a natural conversation. We even have a number of, of strategies where we use technology with we've got key words on our keypad so that if you were to type say stressed um, can't cope or something like that those keywords are picked up and our safeguarding team will actually reach out and contact uh, the learner who's actually been affected and we can bring in safe spaces to have these conversations to make you know make it be a natural conversation and somewhere that where they might not feel that with their employer that they can have these open discussions like what we're having here but it's badminton's a safe space where we can explore how you're feeling and working together to move on so you can really put that learning at the forefront I think it's a really it's really interesting to say to hear that that Claire because you know obviously the the other thing to sort of bring out and and Judith posted a really great question which I think applies to both learning and anyone in the workplace but how do we ensure people don't get more withdrawn and distant in a virtual world and I think it's a really it's been a problem and a challenge so Jess 
Claire or Rachel, you know, any three of you really want to kind of sort of come in on that question because I think it's a really timely one to ask, especially in the context of what we're doing here at Babington and, and for anyone that's listening in from a workplace perspective right now. Take that one, I'm happy to. Thanks, Jess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go for it, Jess. Yeah, yeah, thank you. In terms of my experience around uh, hybrid working, so we were thrown into the virtual working almost completely for those that were desk based. And what what we're doing now is reimagining the balance for people. So we talked before the call started actually around, is it three days? Is it two days? Is it totally flexible? And I think what it'll work differently for every organisation, depending on the role, depending on the team, depending on the output. But I think what's really important is that there's a recognition that if people are working virtually most of the time, there's even more demand on a manager or a leader to check in and to be, you know, you're not able to pick up on body language in the same way you would in the, in the workplace. There's many things that you miss out on as a leader and a manager that are um, unconscious a lot of the time, and you have to bring that into your consciousness in a hybrid and a virtual world. So it's, it's that checking in giving people options not to be on camera all the time so they're not back to back. I, I found during the pandemic, um, lots of clients were filling filling the day more than they ever would um, pre-pandemic. They were back to back agendas, you know, not having breaks um, and not having time for those um, unscripted and agenda based um, conversations that are just casual um, and it can feel a little bit um what's the word, artificial at times, but actually just checking back in and, and to Rachel's point and to my point earlier is authenticity is key. So if you're asking people how they're doing, you're genuinely listening, keeping eye contact, which is very, very hard to do on a virtual. I, I look now that like I'm looking down, not looking at the camera, but that, I think I could struggle to look at the camera the whole time. So, you know, just being really aware of those real subtle cues of how people are doing. Um, but also I feel like during the pandemic, things started to drop off such as employee feedback, employee surveys, employee li continuous listening, you know, those things maybe what took a back seat and now's the time more than ever to start ramping those back up again, actually, and, and keeping that anonymous where possible. If you don't have a safe culture at the moment, the, if you can guarantee anonymity um, for people, you're more likely to get a real view of how things are. Um, if you've got a relatively safe space at the moment then great create that culture where it's not so anonymous and people can give feedback in a in a way that's not going to have ramifications for them so i think my advice in this new world of hybrid where i reimagine it is to to keep those things that were happening before ramp them back up again and authenticity is, is key is probably how i'd round that up yeah brilliant and and I know Claire, you've got your hand up patiently so i'm assuming you wanted to sort of tip in on that that, yeah. that point there <laughs> Yeah, so I think Jess is right. I mean, from what I, I though I've worked um, virtually and in hybrid working for eight years, my biggest surprise was the cramming into every minute of the day with meetings, as Jess has identified. That was a real surprise. But managing managers, as I do in my role, you've got to really plan. So you've got to plan that contact. Before you know it, three months has passed. So you've really got to be careful with your diary. So you're planning that contact time and it depending on the level of need with the individual and then also how are you yourself as a manager if you're managing via a manager how are you going to get your presence how are you going to show that you're actually supportive and in terms of where we were talking about the feedback and the safe space what we've actually done at Babington we have winning temps and that's great because you can feed back on a number of topics either anonymously or you can you can state your name if, if you wish and it shows a temperature check and that's really useful for me as a manager so i may not see the team but i'm getting that vibe some organizations use office vibe actually it's called but we use winning temps and that's something that's been really useful if as an organization you're not using it i would recommend that that strategy yeah yeah absolutely claire it's a really great point and i think you know just listening to a lot of those things that you're saying and i know we talked about you know how do sort of learners you know stay you know stay connected you know we've talked a lot about how do you create those events and those talking spaces and, and those forums and another another area that, that that anyone that's listening that does have apprentices is and um, certainly with Babington is that we work with the Association of Apprentices and that's a, got a really unique formula in that there is a it is a 
apprentice for apprentice forum space where apprentices can talk to each other and it's very exclusive to them it's very you know private to them so they're able to sort of build those networks and relationships and you know build those inclusive those inclusive conversations that you were talking about jess where maybe that's a you know way of creating opportunity for people to converse without feeling you know um that that the sort of a ramification for saying things so it's very you know for apprentices and only apprentices get to view that um it is obviously modern moderated but not by us as a training provider or by the employer and I think creating those spaces and conversation points as you were saying for for junior members of staff it's it's really important isn't it that they can have those those spaces to to, to open up and talk yeah. brilliant I think okay. um, uh, Kate oh sorry <laughs> I think I'm so sorry Caitlin's question in the chat it's really it is really interesting, actually, and, and just definitely one for you and I to associate with, because she talks about how we get this subject higher up the exec suites agenda and specifically when it's a technology led and sort of data and evidence led culture. And of, of course, that's what, you know, we spent, well, me 20 years, you, I think nearly 10 years in an engineering um, technical organisation driving this agenda. So I don't know if there's anything that you can share that, that we we found that worked there. Yeah, so I, I think I, just to read your question again. So I think what you're talking about is people prioritizing this over operational. Is that the right question? Yeah. Um, so so we see it all the time. You know, I don't have time to do this. And and really, I, I could do a whole separate session on performance enablement. And actually, that for me is when you've got yeah. managers who are talking about there's no time for this, they, they, they go down that performance we're moving away from performance management to performance enablement and it's really the two are very very different performance management is unless i'm on top of you checking on you you're not going to perform whereas performance enablement is that much safer space that i trust you i feel like you're if you're not doing a good job there's probably something in the way and i'm going to have to unblock it as a manager and my job as a manager is very much to facilitate your success that's a whole, you know, I could definitely talk about a couple of hours on that topic, but I think organisations that have are, are in that old performance management world will be driving that, um, you know, need for speed, not prioritising effectively, that chaotic environment that I described where I don't have time to do the stuff that I know actually will help me be better because when my teams are engaged, I do better as a manager because my teams are working harder. Sometimes they feel they're on a hamster wheel and they can't get off to actually do the groundwork they need to do. So for me, I would always at that point say you need to shift to performance enablement and what that looks like and to help organisations to get off the hamster wheel to be able to better anticipate and prioritise so that you are engaging people. Like I said at the beginning, it's that balance between people, profits, and planet which is something that's very close to my heart so it's you know that it's always trying to balance those three and when you tip into that operational at the expense of people's well-being health we know that you pay a cost later on down the line we know that and we can demonstrate that through research and evidence um but actually it's helping people know and most people most managers know that they know that they what they're doing isn't great but they just don't know how to stop they don't know how to create the space to be able to stop to do the right thing yeah, and the other thing I would add, Jess, if you remember that certainly when we were working at Talis is that we almost used our leadership sort of model as well to help reinforce, you know, some of these behaviours around leadership that drive this more psychological safety culture and, and the associated behaviours. So again, you know, if you're a new manager or you're joining the business, you actually begin to understand, you know, how should managers make people feel? What environment do people want to create? So having that framework of those of you that have got leadership models and just thinking about the things that we've said today and actually how could there be a behaviour specifically that's driving towards that, you know, psychologically safe culture that we know if we get it right, you really see people perform. You know, people can have great ideas. Sometimes, you know, um, they're not always the great idea first, but from a not so good idea, sometimes a brilliant idea can be born. So you just want to make sure that you're giving people that environment to, to have a go. So yeah. something I've always sort of led my teams on. So and Mohammed, you've made some great comments as well. Thank you for your your comments in the chat too. I don't know if you want to come in, but as you've you've made some sort of nice assumptions really about what this is about. So I was just uh, covered. Well, we we couldn't speak, so I thought I'd just write down what I was thinking and feeling. Uh, obviously, great. The great points that Jessica's making, and then over the years, I'm, I'm not a youngster anymore. <laughs> I've come into apprenticeships now, and I'm seeking for a different world because um, many years ago I actually taught apprentices, and now I am one. 
So now I'm oh. getting a whole new perspective on the world. And I, I, I love the things that neurodiversity that Philip was speaking about the other day in his lecture. And, and it's just making me think more about the things about how, how we can benefit society. And my eventual goal is to go into leadership myself. Um, that's another story. <laughs> but, uh, initially, I'm just going to do the apprenticeship and work from that. But um, I love the, the way that this, this work-life balance and how we can uh, interact with each other. And then just this thing with the Zoom and the Microsoft Teams and how this is all, the, it, it's, it's just enriching our, our whole perspective on life. And I, I'm always up for that. So mm -hmm. if we can do more of this, the better. Thank Great, you. thank you. I love that word, enriching. And I think that that is, we take the best of all the bits and then we create this totally different working world. And um, I think the organisations that really embrace that are the ones that are going to really benefit um, hugely. In a track. And just on that that note from Caitlin, and I think Sharon um, has picked up on it as well. I would love to know more about performance management versus performance enablement. Um, Jess and I were talking about that the other week. So if that's of interest to everybody, give us a thumbs up at the end, and perhaps that's our next um, webinar that we'll do, and we'll, we'll come on and give you some insight into that because it's um, yeah. it's certainly a, a great topic and something we need in our kit bags from a leadership point of view, and certainly the HR community supporting us. So yeah, if you want to like Caitlin's thing, that will give us um, an indication of perhaps our next webinar, which we'll always love to be um, client led. Sorry, Phil, sure. have we got any more questions because we've got a couple of minutes left. Yeah, I mean, Mohammed, you put your hand up just there, so I didn't want to interrupt oh. you. Did you have something else uh, to ask? Uh, I was just saying, we touched a little bit on uh, emotional intelligence, how that can be used in leadership and, and those sort of roles and, and what you've been dwelling upon all those slides are excellent I, I love the way it's all been put together Maslow's hierarchy of needs of course that goes back to uh, right uh, education as it is and, and looking at the top of the pyramid and, and working all the way through a structure I can see how that's the benefit that will have for every every company and um, I'm just all for this we, we need to do more of these seminars and talk to people and get the word out there because the more people who understand this and see it and hear it the better it'll be for everybody. So I'm, I'm hooked up. Thanks, guys. And I, just to add to that, so when I work with organisations on change and how do you get this to be embedded, yeah. um, I always, when, whenever it comes to change, and a lot of this is on leaders and managers to start to do things differently, and I always put people in three categories. So you've got the, the leaders and managers that just get this. They're doing it anyway. They don't need any guidance. They're just role models. You've then got usually the largest population of leaders and managers they're the ones that they want to do better they just don't know how they're the ones that are probably drowning in the operational delivery they're drowning in you know the to-do list as long as they're armed but they genuinely would change things if they had the right guidance support resources and then you of course always do have a small proportion of managers who probably shouldn't be managers or leaders and they're they're not really willing to change or adapt or learn and what i find is a lot of organizations get stuck on that last group and they try and change and move that last group but my advice is definitely to use your role model group to upskill your middle group and then the last group tend to self-select in a way so um organizations that feel stuck on that those the naysayers the people that are maybe a bit resistant to this stuff Try not to give that as much as attention as I've seen clients tend to to get stuck on that space. So, just some insights on change management, I guess, in terms of bringing this stuff and embedding it in organisations. So I think we've got one Brilliant. last question, Phil. Yeah. So from Sally, um, thank you, Sally. We've got where does psychological safety sit? And I think you're talking about this in terms of maybe ownership in the organisation. So is it well-being? Is it EDI? Is it organisational development? Or can you advise how it straddles all really, Jess? So yeah, a great question. Yeah, it's really good. And I, I often see organisations splitting out things into different centres of excellence and maybe doing different things that maybe don't speak to each other. For me, when you're looking at culture, when you're looking at um, leadership capability, performance enablement, regardless of where they sit in an organisation, they have to be joined up. They're one story. These things used to be like, not anymore, thankfully, but when I first started in HR, these things were classed as CSR, corporate social responsibility. The, these were, weren't even on the HR agenda to the degree which they are today, um, but the, it has to be led by leaders and managers. And I think the, the role of HR is to facilitate, guide best practice thinking, you know, best thought leadership on this stuff, but the people who are bringing this to life every single day for the people is, is certainly the managers and leaders and that we know that, you know, you know, 
but that's the thing that makes it the most challenging in some ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Um, thanks, Jess. And then I've got another question here from Gabriella. Um, so this is quite an interesting one to sort of uh, viewers perspective. So I got the understanding that performance enablement is is equal to a laissez-faire leadership style. So, or are they not codependent? So, yeah, that's an interesting perspective that you've heard or, or, or got the understanding from Gabriella. What are your thoughts, Jess, on on that one then? If I understand that correctly, is that alluding to what I was talking to earlier when people say oh, it's all a bit fluffy? You know, you need to command and control if you're going to get people to do what they need to do. I see it all the time, um, and actually, the people that tend to feel that way they haven't lived it they haven't experienced it because there's so much evidence um that that isn't the case and actually i've experienced it firsthand where you've got really strong performing organizations um that are also psychologically safe that have strong cultures that have performance enablement cultures so um but i'm not surprised in your comment we do see that association all the time and i think it's up to people like us to prove that that isn't the case and to showcase and demonstrate that that isn't the case um, ultimately, we know that um, people will not work for organisations that don't feel psychologically safe if they have an option not to. Um, so even from a basic talent attraction perspective, you know, you're missing out in that in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's been some really great questions coming up in the chat, and I just want to make sure if there are any more that you know, has triggered or you thought something that you really want to ask Jess or, or any of our panel, Rachel or Claire, then then do do put them in there. But I guess um, just while there may be some questions that are coming up, I, I think, you know, what would be really nice to probably end the session on, Jess, is just a bit about um, your experience of, of a company that you think has really successfully implemented a safe environment and, you know, where's where are the role models out there that you've come across that if you know anyone's sort of listening, watching, um, being on, on the session today could sort of look up to and, and take some lessons from what, where, where would that be? So I, I'm working with a really interesting organisation at the moment who are on a, a real journey of this and thankfully it's a founder based organisation. Thankfully, the founder is very, very much open to feedback. Otherwise, it would be very, very difficult to have any impact or change within the organisation. Um, but one of the things that I've learned through the process is that um, when the pressure and stress is on, people revert back to what's comfortable. And so what this is, is about constantly reminding, constantly trialing new ways of working, constantly. Um, it's, it's about small steps. It's not about game changing. You know, one day they're like this, the next day somebody's completely different because that's not authentic. So it's been a real careful balance between small steps reminding the leaders within that organization that yes there will be times where we revert back to the pressure and the stress and the, the the unsafe environment starts to creep back in and we remind ourselves of what we're trying to achieve it's a long process it's not it's culture change it doesn't happen overnight but i think one of the key things that has allowed me to have impact within this organization is that the founder and the leader that i'm i'm working with is open to it despite the fact that I do get a tough time doesn't make it easy for me does tell me that at times you know it's not going to work or reverts back to to old ways of working but we keep persevering and that is the the point it's it's really difficult in change management and you know it's it's not a it's not a one size fits all and it's definitely not an overnight job and it can be very very draining if you're working in that change space because people go through the cycle of change they're on board one minute they're totally off board the next minute you have to bring them back in and, and what I see is progress over perfection and I always say that you know it's we're not aiming for a perfect environment here but as long as we can see that it's going in the right direction um, and so I've seen some real huge pivot it's, when I think about just six months ago um, I didn't think we'd be where we are at now so it is possible it's possible to change those difficult cultures quite toxic cultures at times um, it is difficult to create change in those Brilliant. Fantastic, Jess. Look, I think it's been um, 
a really insightful, enjoyable uh, hour. I'm really pleased that I spent this time with you, Jess, and, and the rest of the audience today. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I hope everyone else that's joined and listened in has found this really um, beneficial. And there's lots of great points, real great takeaways within there. Um, and yes, the recording will be shared. Um, we're going to be sharing the recording with the slides afterwards. Um, but we're also going to be um, just letting you know that if there are any um, if you want to be in touch with us um, or want to hear more, um, then you can contact Rachel Kay um, or any one of the teams here at Babington. And um, yeah, we're really uh, happy that we've shared this webinar with you today and, and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Just Thank to mention. I was just going to mention if there's anyone on the HR level seven programme that I'm going to be doing some coaching on that. So um, hopefully I'll get to meet some of you. You then. Of course. Thanks, Jess. Yes, of course. Absolutely. Brilliant. All right, thank everyone. You, have a yeah, thank you, Jess. And thanks, thanks everyone to our panel. Thanks, sir. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a good day, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you, thank you very much.